The eighth and final season of Game of Thrones premiered on April 14th, 2019. A lot has been building up to this moment. Everyone was excited to see the resolution of all of our favorite characters. And based on the seventh season, this new season was about as good as I was expecting. Have you shot your final scenes yet? And are you happy with how things ended? Yes. <laughs> she didn't say yes. You didn't say yes. Best season ever! <laughs> The fan reception of the season has been largely mixed. Certain sects were satisfied for the most part. Others thought the season was poorly written, simplistic, stupid. I'm well aware from my last Game of Thrones video that there are people waiting for me to rip this new season to shit. I'm not, as David Ayer would say, over, over the, the top, top vitriolic, vitriolic when it comes to things I like, movies I like, shows I like, and Game of Thrones is a good show overall. And I like it. There's a difference between something like Game of Thrones and something I've ripped to shreds like Reprisal or Gotti. I'll take you anytime, punk. Those movies are just awful and lazy, and it's clear no one cared about them. Game of Thrones is not that way at all. Everyone involved with the show, except maybe the writers, clearly care about this show. The production design is fantastic, way better than anything in most television and movies. The acting is all terrific, the characters are all great, even this season, the characters have their moments. Even at its worst, there is still tons of passion and hard work put into every aspect of production. From the visual effects to the costumes, a huge cast of diverse characters and actors, all taking this material very seriously. And these interesting characters and concepts pull the show along to its conclusion. There is simply no reason to be hateful toward the people who make this show. Because they did their best. They really did. And it's a shame it didn't work out. To discount all of this hard work and passion and just say, Oh, this show sucks. I could not have worked harder. I really have given this everything I have. The people in charge got a little lazy on the latest episode. Oh, there's a coffee cup on the table? Man, this production crew is so lazy. Meanwhile, you flip the channel to another television station and it's like... I've decided to live my life 100% by the Bible. To the letter. <laughs> Donuts in the hazy! How I watch Game of Thrones now is very different to how I watch seasons 1 to 4, and even 5 and 6. People complain about 5 and 6 all the time, but those are still really, really good seasons of television. These seasons have their weak moments for sure, but the character writing and the unpredictability is still there. Hard Home is an excellent episode. The characters like Stannis Baratheon are really well handled. Do you have any last words? Go on, do your duty. The battles are fantastic. Hard Home, of course, but also the Battle of the Bastards. Seasons 1 to 4 of this show are brilliant. They present a fully fleshed out, detailed fantasy landscape with an intricate political drama underneath it. The lesser explored parts of the fantasy genre, the politics of ruling a kingdom, the horrors of war, how indulgence of power contaminate the ruling class, every character from the kings and queens of the land to the blacksmiths and the soldiers is fully fleshed out and brought to life. I have a newfound appreciation for season 5 after these seasons. At least it took its time. The High Sparrow was a good character. Tyrion met Daenerys, that was cool. Someday, if you decide not to execute me, I'll tell you all about why I killed my father. And on that day, should it ever come, we'll need more wine than this. And episodes like Hard Home and Mother's Mercy from season 5 are so good. It's a show about war, and in war, no one is safe. So many great characters bite the dust, but there are so many other great characters to take their place. So the stakes felt real and immediate. You genuinely didn't know where the story was going or what was gonna happen to these people. I can't say the same for the last two seasons. This simply isn't the quality of writing I've come to expect from Game of Thrones. God damn it, we want a zombie polar bear. These people have spent so much of their lives crafting this experience for us, and I'm grateful to so many of them. The issue 100% is the scripts. Everything else is there, it's just the story is so rushed and bad. I don't hate these guys. I think they did an excellent job adapting George R. R. Martin's source material to the screen. 
However, this is their show, they're in charge, they wrote some of these episodes even, and the level of writing is in the toilet. You are my queen. You are my queen. She is our queen. And you will always be my queen. You are my queen. I don't know what else I can say. So the reason the show feels as though it's been dumbed down over the years is because it's no longer based on the Song of Ice and Fire novel series written by George R. R. Martin. The television show relied heavily on these books. There were plenty of changes when adapting it to the screen, of course. Characters were made older than they were in the books, the amount of locations and characters were cut down, certain plot threads were removed, but overall, the show was extremely faithful to the books. It captured the tone and the twisted, violent, sex-riddled world of Westeros really well. George R.R. Martin is co-executive producer of the show, and he even wrote four episodes, which are some of the better episodes of the series. He wrote the Blackwater episode, as well as the Lion and the Rose. As time has gone on, George has had less involvement in the show, and he hasn't added to his Song of Ice and Fire series since 2011. The writers of Game of Thrones ran out of material to take from the books, and so they had to start coming up with their own stuff. Of course, they had Cliff Notes versions of what generally happens in the books, but there was a fuck ton of material that had to be sorted through and resolved. George just had a bunch of spinning plates, and he just threw it up in the air and said, you guys catch it now, and he left. And now Weiss and Benioff are like trying to catch all the dishes. The reason most people watched Game of Thrones at first is because it was a mature, intelligent take on the fantasy genre. The characters were great, there was lots of interesting lore, and now the show has become no different than anything else you'd find in the fantasy genre. Whether it be a movie, television show, or a book. Dragon fights, arrows, swords, it's cool for a little while, but it's become the crux of the show. When the character development isn't working, let's just cut to some action, or quip, or visual effect. John and Daenerys have no chemistry? Oh, let's we'll just have them fly CGI dragons together. And then they can hang out in front of a CGI waterfall. It's cold up here for a southern girl. So keep your queen warm. Then you watch the behind the scenes promotional material for the show, featuring the two creators. While there's no reason to know for certain that the fire wouldn't kill, destroy the Night King, there's also no particular reason to believe that it would. I don't learn anything about the production from these. What it has become, basically, is these two explaining away everything they know people are going to complain about. I'm sure a lot of people would have uh, been okay with not having there if we had demanded to cut it, but I think they also understood why we needed to give one of the strongest smaller people in the show uh, a chance to go out taking down one of the strongest larger things we've uh, we've ever seen in the show. Yeah, you really could have cut it out. I don't even know how to compare these two seasons, honestly. I've grown to not like either of them. At least Ed Sheeran wasn't in it. At least there wasn't anything as bad as that Arya Sansa Peter Baelish subplot. They wouldn't think much of Lady Sansa if they knew how she did Cersei's bidding. What would little Leanna Mormont say? She's younger than you were when you wrote this. Are you going to say, but I was just a child? Okay, so either Arya is a hypocrite, or the writers just forgot about this entire season where she did Tywin Lannister's bidding, and she could have killed him, but... I'll fetch my word for the fire, my lord. Mm. Fetch me the history of the greater and the lesser houses. It's the one on the... <laughs> Sit. Eat. My lord. I wonder what it would feel like to wear those pretty dresses. To be the Lady of Winterfell. Look after one another. Sansa is your sister. I don't hate her. Not really. Littlefinger, one of the smartest guys in Westeros, is thwarted by three kids. <laughs> The plan to send seven guys north of the Wall, including the King of the North, to grab an undead guy out of a giant horde of undead people and White Walkers was absurd. So it irritates me when I when I I'm watching a movie and or reading a book and the hero is going through incredible dangers, him and his six buddies, and none of them die. You know, maybe one of them gets wounded at some point. Uh, but they, they all survive. Yeah. What does this idiot know about Game of Thrones? Fuck you. We cannot afford a 
a zombie polar bear. This year made perfect sense that you could have one of these things out there. And we really put our, our four feet down and we said, fuck you. Literally the whole episode was just people popping into Winterfell. Hey, Gendry's here. What's up, Gendry? Hey, look, it's the Hound. What's up, Arya and the Hound are together. What the Hey, look, Tyrion and Sansa's together. What's up, everybody? Hey, look, Jamie's here. What's up, Brandon Jamie? John, oh my God. Oh my God, it's Edison. Dolan, what's up, Edison? Give me a break. Here's the fact that they're coming back together again for the first time means more to them than it may mean to us. And there's so much dialogue in this episode that's like, remember when we did that? You left me to die. First I robbed you. This episode should have just been a clip show. Jon Snow and Daenerys Targaryen have absolutely no chemistry. We could stay a thousand years. No one would find us. We'd be pretty old. I don't understand why these characters are together at all. I like the idea more of Daenerys becoming a villain, although it was really rushed, because the idea of these two, like, actually falling in love, uh, I don't believe it at all. I also enjoyed this part thoroughly, because they were talking about how Ed Sheeran got mutilated in the battle. Came back with his face burnt right off. He's got no eyelids now. How does he sleep with no eyelids? Yeah, fuck you, Ed. Sam telling John that he's a Targaryen. You're the true king. Aegon Targaryen, sixth of his name, protector of the realm, all of him. Considering we knew all this information already, I thought this scene was very well executed. I'm not king in the north anymore. I'm not talking about the king in the north, I'm talking about the king of the bloody seven kingdoms. And then John turns and starts approaching him, and you can see like Sam is like scared for a second of what John's gonna do. I'm sorry, I know it's a lot to take. It's really good acting. I think these two actors have great chemistry. It's a shame most of this episode had scenes like this. How are we meant to feed the greatest army the world has ever seen? While I ensured our stores would last through winter, I didn't account for Dothraki, Unsullied, and two full-grown dragons. That's a good concern to raise, Sansa. How are we gonna feed all these people and dragons? What do dragons eat, anyway? Whatever they want. Oh, and then they never bring it up again. You see, like, the dragons kind of eating some bones. Like, I guess they're kind of hungry. But it doesn't affect their performance in the battle, I don't think. This is never brought up again. This is a writing trick this season uses a lot, and I think it's very lazy. Usually, a character would pose, like, a serious question. Did you bend the knee to save the North? Or because you love her? And then the scene would just end. But I am her queen. If she can't respect me. And we said we'd never bow to anyone else again. What about the North? Apologies, my lady. Oh, well, I guess we'll find out next episode. I personally enjoyed a lot about this episode. This episode was primarily focused on character relationships and resolving certain threads between characters that were left unresolved prior. Arya and Sandor had a nice scene together. Beric coming in was the cherry on top. The Lord of Light's gonna wonder why I brought you back 19 times just to watch you die when I chuck you over this fucking wall. Everything with Brienne and Jaime from her vouching for him at his trial. Without him, my lady, you would not be alive. He armed me armored me and sent me to find you and bring you home because he'd sworn an oath to your mother. You vouch for him. I do. To him knighting her in front of a small group of friends, their performances were wonderful and these scenes were truly touching. Heart is something the show hasn't had in a long, long time. It's funny after these past two seasons of violence, death, fire, a giant army of undead people, battles. The most powerful moment of these past few seasons was this. Arise, Brienne of Toth, a knight of the Seven Kingdoms. 
This is why the show has worked for as long as it has. Sure, it's not based on the books, but the actors really carry this thing. You would fight beside him. I would. This is like the first episode in the past two seasons that Tyrion Lannister felt like Tyrion Lannister. I wish father were here. I would love to see the look on his face when he realizes his two sons are about to die defending Winterfell. This episode was one of my favorites of the season because I felt multiple emotions during it. It wasn't just one long battle. There were parts that were serious involving the plot having to do with the White Walkers and the battle. Dragonfly will stop him. I don't know. No one's ever tried. Then you got like some sexual tension. Yes, well, I'm glad you're here. Here, fighting with us. Glad you survived Eastwatch. And then you have sweet, touching moments like Sam giving Jorah his sword. It's Valyrian steel. I'd be honored if you take it. And then you got some comedy in there, too. Half a cup. And you? No, thank you. I should try and get some sleep. You really think any of us are going to sleep tonight? How did I feel about Arya and Gendry being together? It was fine. That's how I feel about this whole subplot. So this is like the last time I'm gonna mention it. The worst scene in this episode was Davos giving the soup to that kid. All the children will be going below when the time comes. But both my brothers were soldiers. But the scene was largely unnecessary. The dialogue was corny. The child performance wasn't very convincing. All right, I'll defend the crypt then. This is the best episode of the season because it has the least plot development in it. The worst part of the show now is the plot. You'd have a claim to the Iron Throne. Oh, thank God, the plot's moving forward. I can just leave her hanging. Yeah, Daenerys, I'm just gonna leave you with this giant bombshell, and then we're gonna go fight the battle, and it's not gonna come up at all. You couldn't tell her after? Like, if you all died, she never had to know. All of these characters, all of these plot lines, and all of this buildup, so that it can be resolved in one battle. I'm guessing the war for the living is way more complicated in the books. First of all, the fact that they chose to hold up in Winterfell was dumb. Like, Winterfell is, like, the worst position. You're just gonna get surrounded by them, and then they're just gonna crush you. If I was Jon Snow, I'm just saying, I would have gone to the Vale of Arryn and fought the battle there. It's almost as if the purpose of all that plot development with Littlefinger and him becoming the ruler of the Eyrie was so that their army could fight the undead when the time came. They could all just hold up shop in the Vale because it's super secure. The only way to enter the Eyrie is, like, this narrow path. And in the narrow path, there's a series of gates. There's one called the Bloody Gate. You can funnel the entire army of the undead through there and have the dragon just shoot fire down on them. A dozen armies have attempted to cross the mountains and invade the Vale, but it's never happened. The second they established that once you kill a White Walker, all of the undead people they possess die immediately, I knew we were in for disappointment. It's revealed that the zombies all fall down and die when you kill the White Walker, which I'm not too sure how I feel about that. If you kill these five White Walkers, you kill the entire army of the dead. It felt very like we have to write ourselves out of a hole. We can't have our characters kill a hundred thousand dead people. So if we'll just have them, if you kill these five people, you'll be fine. It was like the end of Avengers where they didn't know how to, you know, get rid of all the aliens attacking the city. So if you kill the main bad guy, all the aliens just die. The score was very good throughout this entire season, but some of the best tracks are in this episode. The performances were pretty solid throughout the entire episode. Uh, except for that part. Certain character deaths were very well handled. I enjoyed Theon's final moments. You're a good man. As well as Jorah Mormont. There's lots of really impressive long takes and visual effects. The building of suspense and the use of silence is very good. I do have complaints with a lot of the technical aspects of this battle, but overall Miguel Sapuknik's direction is very good, which is what I've come to expect from him, as he's directed some of the best episodes. Okay, can we get back to Lady Mormont now? <laughs> This scene was so goofy and should have been cut out. When she got knocked over by the giant, that was hilarious. 
Lady Mormont has been the biggest non-character throughout this entire show. Aside from her first scene, she has served no function in the story at all. This is basically the point where I started to turn on the episode. It's very hard to see what's happening because the whole battle is so dark. And I understand they did this because they want to build this sense of dread, and they want the White Walkers to feel real. I understand that if this was all overly lit, it would look really cheap. But at the same time, it's so dark, it's hard to see what's happening. And then we cut to Arya's stupid library thing, which feels like it's a different show. And the lighting from outside is blue all of a sudden, even though from what we saw before, it was orange. Also, it was like the apocalypse outside. There was fire and screaming, sounds of flames, and then you go in this library and you can hear a pin drop. Oh no, the zombie heard Arya under the table. I wonder if she's gonna make it out all right. Whoa, where did she go? Then she throws a book to lure the undead away from the door. It's like I'm watching someone play The Last of Us. This isn't interesting. The pace change and the tonal change, it was really important to have that in this episode, otherwise the episode would start to feel, would start to feel monotonous. You could have just made this episode shorter. It depends on the tone of your show, of course, but Game of Thrones has always presented more grounded battles involving strategy and planning. Most of the first few seasons were just spent planning battles. Every scene with Rob was him standing by a map moving around pieces, trying to figure out what the hell to do. If we take Tywin's castle from him, the Lords of Westeros will realize he's not invincible. Take his home, take his gold, take his power. I wanted to draw the mountain into the west, into our country where we could surround him and kill him. I wanted him to chase us, which he would have done because he is a mad dog without a strategic thought in his head. I could have that head on a spike by now. Does no one do that anymore? Well, like this scene where they're all gathered together, trying to figure out how to stop the army of the undead. We need to lure him into the open before his army destroys us all. I'll wait for him in the godswood. We'll hold off the rest of them for as long as we can. Let's get some rest. What the fuck? That's not a plan! Everyone get back to the fucking table right now! You gotta figure out what you're doing! No one even thought that the Night King was gonna resurrect all the dead people in the crypt. Did they not know? Uh, John clearly knew, cause he saw the Night King resurrect all these people at Hardhome. Did he just forget about it? We'll put you in the crypt where it's safest. No. We're in a crypt. Nobody thought of that. He's bringing all the dead people back to life, and they put the women and children in a crypt with all the dead people. So... Rah. Tyrion is smart, but I guess not that smart. There's too many points of view, we're following too many characters, a lot of them have plot armor on, like Brienne and Jaime are literally pinned against a wall the entire episode. Every time we cut to Brienne, she's like screaming at the top of her lungs, fucking against a wall. They both would make it out alright. It's cheap to put these characters in these incredibly dangerous circumstances, and they just come out alive. I understand the Lord of Light wants to keep certain people alive, but it's gotten to a point where it's just ridiculous. It's way too hard to make out what's going on with Daenerys and Jon in this battle. It's cut too quick, the shots are too close, it's too dark, and there's too much snow and other stuff flying at the lens. <laughs> Blackwater is a great episode, and the combat stuff is pretty minimal. The caravan attack with the dragons was better from last season. The Watchers on the Wall episode was better. That was an awesome battle, and it had a very similar tone to this battle. First of all, the whole episode was a battle. It was dark, huge hordes of people, lots of fire, and snow. So why is this Watchers on the Wall battle better? Well, a few things. First of all, the cinematography is way better. Awesome. On top of it, we have a very clear point of view. We follow Jon Snow throughout the entire battle, so it's not confusing as to what's happening. We cut away to other characters briefly, such as Ygrid, Sam, and Glenn. But for the most part, we follow Jon. Obviously, Kit's the center of this episode. He's the centerpiece of the episode. Watching him 
assume the mantle of authority without particularly wanting to assume the mantle of authority. So who's the main character of The Long Night? Who's the main point of view that we're following throughout the entire battle? Is it Arya? HBO implies it's Arya with this description, but we don't really follow Arya at all until like a half hour into the episode. Let's see how the Watchers on the Wall episode starts. Oh wow, it's the main characters. John, the guy we're following, and also Sam, a tertiary character who we follow briefly. If you really wanted to show this whole Arya proves her worth as a fighter, start the episode with Arya trying to prove her worth as a fighter. Oh, so we're following Sam? Okay, that's interesting. Oh, I guess now we're following Tyrion. Alright, and now we're at Sansa. The first time we see Arya is in this shot, and she's like in the corner. There's no emphasis drawn on Arya at all, either because they just didn't think about it, or because they didn't want us to see it coming that Arya would kill the Night King. And I don't have an issue with Arya killing the Night King, because honestly it makes sense to me. I know a lot of people have criticized it for that, but this is what happens in the books. Arya's been training to be an assassin for years, so it makes sense for me, in the plot, for her to kill the Night King. But the issue is Arya has no attachment to the Night King at all. It isn't her fight. It hasn't been part of her story. She's been so distant from everything else going on in Westeros, and for her to just pop in and kill the Night King and not even care is ridiculous. Uh, once again, I have no issue with Arya killing the Night King. It just needed to be written better. Does she have to, like, pop out of the background in this very corny way? All right, so let's go back to the Watchers on the Wall episode. The Night's Watch don't open the gates and let all of the Night's Watch guys run out into the giant open field. They stay behind the wall and they shoot arrows from above the wall. The wildling strategies make sense. You know, a season before, they were sending wildlings over the wall so that they can ambush Castle Black from behind. And then Mance Raider makes a distraction and then they send the Fens to attack Castle Black from behind. It makes so much sense. It's smart. It's like a real battle or something. At the end of the day, it's all of these characters we like fighting a bunch of undead people. Where the Watchers on the Wall battle had a lot more personal stuff going on, especially with Jon and Egrid. Jon Snow is mine. Anyone else tries to kill him, I'll have an arrow for them. Jon has the stereotype of what a wildling is based on stories from his father and the Night's Watch. And not only does Egrid shatter his expectations of what a wildling is, he actually falls in love with her. This shows him that the wildlings are human beings too, and that if they work together, they could stop the threat of the Night King. There was real personal connection to these people. Jon is conflicted between the Night's Watch and the first woman he's ever fallen in love with. That's drama. Not to mention, they just have way more chemistry. Partly because these two are dating in real life, but also the way the characters were written just made sense for them to come together. Because John is very stern and stoic and serious about everything. And he's kind of a buffoon too, because he's never seen the real world. He's never seen North of the Wall. He's lived most of his life in this confined castle, Winterfell. You're even dumber than you look. In the books, he's only 14 when he goes and joins the Night's Watch. You know, but because he grew up in this sheltered environment, he has principles and a code, and he believes in fighting for the greater good, not so much fighting for yourself, whereas wildlings kind of have the opposite philosophy, and Egret has the opposite philosophy. People work together when it suits them. They're loyal when it suits them. They love each other when it suits them, and they kill each other when it suits them. She knows it, you don't. Which is why you'll never hold on to her. You know, she's very sarcastic and snarky. She does whatever she wants. But because she's been out in the world more, she's just more knowledgeable of how it works. And she's tougher for that. They both learn from each other. I don't need you to protect me. Of course you do. We saw Rattleshout when he was about to cut your throat. Who vouched for you with months? Oh, it seems you owe me a debt. Give it back! Oh, well, I stole it. It's mine. You want it? Come steal it back. Egret is way more playful with John, and she enjoys getting him to break the codes of the Night's Walk. Egret. You swore some vows. I want you to break them. Our vows never specifically forbid intimate relations with women. Does John ever say why he likes Daenerys? What does Daenerys like about John? Their personalities are like, kind of whatever. Is it the sex? 
Again, with John and Egret, it made sense, because, you know, John did that thing with his mouth. That thing you did. With your mouth. So what lords do to their ladies in the south? And you know, Daenerys had sex with that guy, Dario Naharis. What, like Jon Snow's gonna top him? Let's stay here a while longer. I don't ever want to leave this cave, Jon Snow. Not ever. We could stay a thousand years. No one would find us. We'd be pretty old. It was better than episode 6 of last season, I guess. And a few of the duller battles, like when the Harpies attacked Danny in that stadium. Does anyone remember that scene? How about the Battle of Whispering Wood? Does anyone remember that one? Tyrion doesn't. Yeah. Because Tyrion got knocked out. This episode, which is titled Baylor, by the way, is one of the best episodes of Game of Thrones, and the giant battle is not even shown, further proving the point that the strengths of Game of Thrones don't solely rely on how cool the battles are. There wasn't like some last piece of information we got right before the Night King died. We never learned anything more about him. We, he didn't say anything. I just wanted to feel as if we were building up to this nice reveal. But instead, nothing is done with the Night King. In the show, I guess they wanted to present the White Walkers more as an unstoppable force. The Night King wasn't necessarily supposed to be a character, but more a plot device to bring everyone together. Maybe in the books they're a bit more fleshed out, but this is the television show. It's a different medium. It's just the White Walkers have been so uninteresting these past few seasons. Because we've come to discover there's not much to them. Nothing about the Lord of Light or the Three-Eyed Raven is ever explained. Like, what was their plan? What were they trying to do? Why did they want Jon alive? In the books, it's implied that there is an answer to all of this. The show just doesn't mention it. Brendan not only helps Jon lead the Night's Watch, it looks like he wants Jon to be the King of Westeros. Now, this is a good time to get into fan theories. 